So this is obviously the second part of what I didn't actually quite get to finish talking about last time. Um, so I'm not actually going to go through the whole story again. Um, I think everybody knows what happened and what my injuries were and, and that sort of thing. Um, and since I actually I, you know, wrote this presentation for you guys, but since, um, since then I've actually delivered it at a couple of other occasions. So it's, the irony is that you are the people it was written for are the last people to actually see it. Um, and I realise that it's um, relatively early in the morning, so I'll try and make it <laughs> fairly light-hearted. Um, and I'm, what I'm really hoping to teach you about is a little bit uh, of some of the, the mechanism behind sort of high-speed motorcycle trauma. I, it would be a bit pointless for me getting up here and telling a room full of, you know, consultants and registrars how to manage a head injury. I think that's sort of me just saying, well, you know, here, suck eggs. Um, but some of the stuff that's really you don't understand or may not know about is the actual mechanism of injury and what that means. Because when someone comes in and the ambulance says, well, this is, this is Joe, and Joe had a low side on the roundabout at 80 k's an hour, that's a very particular mechanism of injury and there's very particular injuries associated with that. Uh, so hopefully I can teach you a few of those sorts of, sorts of things. A lot of it I owe to, to this fellow. This is Dr John Hines. He's a consultant intensivist um, from Northern Ireland. And in his weekends, he provided voluntary um, sort of medical care to Irish road racing. Uh, and tragically, he was killed at the Skerries 100 last year, uh, about three weeks before, um, before I had my accident. Um, of note, the bike that he's on there, that's a BMW S1000 RR. It's 200 horsepower. That's what my mother told me that I should get um, <laughs> after having my accident, which I politely declined. Uh, and instead, I got this. Um, so this is me uh, doing my thing uh, on the old Pacific Highway. Uh, and riding a bike is a little bit different to, to driving a car. Uh, some of the controls are all different. They all do different things. They all have sort of primary and secondary effects. Um, the most interesting thing is obviously the throttle. Uh, and that's what makes you go faster, and it gives you a lot more noise. Um, but the other thing is that you're, if you look at that picture, you'll see that I'm lying on about 550 megajoules of potential energy, um, which is relevant if you uh, have a crash and that starts leaking out all over the road. Um, the brakes work independently. There's front and rear brakes, and either of them will turn it into a meat trebuchet if you use them incorrectly. And um, the thing, whole thing is really red hot. So the exhaust, all of that sort of stuff is, is really, really hot. Uh, and if you look at the exhaust pipe, you'll see that that bit there is actually fire. Um, and the reason it's actually fire is because the bike has a quick shifter on it. Uh, and what that does is interrupt the ignition um, to allow you to change gears. It's very, very fast, very, very smooth. But you get this little bit of unburnt fuel that goes through the exhaust pipe and makes this awesome noise. Um, that's relevant, for, um, that's relevant for if you have a crash, because a, on an older style bike, a quick shifter uh, works directly by interfering with the high voltage coil in the, in the ignition system, and it's a potential source of ignition for fire. Um, so that's actually, you know, it's, it's funny, but it's relevant. Um, you need to have a fair degree of spatial awareness um, to, to do this, particularly on the roads, and you can see this guy is probably not so great. This is the same bend as the, the bike that I, um, my photo was on, but just coming back the other way. Um, and you can see that even though his bike is sort of mostly over the line, his head is certainly not. And it really only takes a car coming back the other way to be overcooking a corner a little bit. Uh, and you've got a pretty, pretty nasty head on. And I think this is similar to what happened to me. Um, I don't think I was sort of like that because I was going back the other way. But I think the car may have overcooked the corner. Um, and it gets pretty dramatic down there. Um, the old Pacific Highway is the most heavily policed bit of road in the state. And um, it's lined with bits of dead motorcycle and, and highway patrol cars. This bike's pretty heavily loaded. As you can see, he's got a rider and a pillion there. Both their bodies are over the line. He's leaning pretty hard um, for, for that corner. And right in front of him is a rock wall. So if he overcooks that corner and goes wide, he's going to get very abruptly decelerated somewhere um, in there which is not great. And the reason they do that is because they want to be like this guy. Um, this guy's Mark Marquez. He's a, a MotoGP um, world champion. They ride you know, incredibly fast, advanced motorcycles. They have you know, 250 plus horsepower. And uh, it's absolutely incredible to watch them, watch them do it. Um, and that's why lean angle and all that sort of stuff is actually really important, because riding it is essentially an exercise in traction management. And if you've got, you know, the set amount of traction and you use 50% of it on 
leaning over to impress your mates, you don't have enough to perhaps apply the brakes in a hurry when you see that there's a kangaroo in the road or a car coming back the other way. Um, and the lean angles that these guys achieve is absolutely incredible. Um, you know, this guy is closer to falling than, um, than actually staying upright. And the reason he stays upright is because he's going so fast. And it, um, it really shows you the incredible engineering that's gone into this, and particularly things like the tyres. And it's not something that you attempt on the road, unless you live in Northern Ireland, in which case it's game on. Um, so this is the Isle of Man, and uh, that's Michael Dunlop. He's going probably about 200 kilometres an hour, and you can see there's a rock wall here, there's trees here, there's a curb there, and he's leant over practically on top of it. Um, so this is the world's most deadly motorcycle race. It's held over two weeks in June. It's actually going at the moment. Um, and uh, it's clearly not a lot of room for error in, in any of these, um, these events. Um, so in terms of talking about sort of bike trauma, in general, um, mechanism really does matter. Okay, so the actually understanding what has happened to that rider will give you an idea of predicting their likely pattern of injuries. Um, the other thing you have to be aware of is that you know, I wear my crumple zone in my, on my head and on my gear and, and, and that sort of thing. So the damage that you see on my helmet and, and that sort of thing may not represent the actual energy that's been transmitted to me. Um, and essentially you get two different crashes. So once you crash your bike, uh, you go one way and your bike goes the other way. So you get two different sort of accidents within the one, within the one crash. Um, what that does mean, however, is that your bike can then chase you up the road. Um, and so you, a motorcycle is unusual in that it's the only vehicle um, that can run over you after you've crashed it. Um, and not just getting run over by, uh, you know, <laughs> being reunited with your lost love, but you can get reunited with pretty much anything else that's in the way. Uh, and the other thing is that there's all this other stuff on the road. So there's curbs, there's, you know, Armco rail, there's trees, there's other cars, there's even a little bump in the road, a little pothole. If you hit that at speed, it's as good as hitting a 10-foot wall, okay? It's, it's really quite, um, quite scary, really. Um, if you hit something, one of two things is going to happen. It's either going to decelerate you quickly, so you come to a dead stop, in which case you're going to get sort of a uh, you know, deceleration injury, um, or it's going to launch you into the air. And if it launches you into the air, the laws of physics say that what goes up must come down, and so you're going to get a fall from height. Um, another word about the fuel tank. When you're sitting astride it, if you are suddenly decelerated, you're going to get a very strong twisting motion around the tank. Um, and basically what that can do is uh, open your pelvis. And so you really have to think very much um, of, a, of a, uh, a pelvic injury in anybody who comes in with isolated um, lower limb injuries because they've been twisted as a result of that and as a result their pelvis has now opened. Um, so the other thing about the fuel tank um, is that it's got a lot of fuel in it and it's strapped to the top of a red hot exhaust system. This is Guy Martin crashing at the Isle of Man TT, uh, I think in 2012. Um, that's the fuel tank there. There's all the fuel. That's Guy Martin. Um, remarkably, he actually survived this crash relatively unscathed. He didn't get significant burns because he had a, was wearing full gear and it was a flash fire. Uh, I think he got a few broken, broken vertebrae or something like that, but um, nothing, nothing too major for a, for a racer. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 would be, I wouldn't call it too major. Um, but anyway, so in terms of actually crashes that happen on the public roads, um, injury patterns are uh, pretty common. Oh, there's three really sort of common things. Firstly, you hit something. Secondly, you fall off and then finally something runs over you, uh, potentially after you've fallen off. Um, this is data from uh, Brazil in 2014. Um, the most recent Australian data is from 2012, but uh, it actually agrees quite well in terms of there's you know, a slight difference in, in the lower limb injuries and, and that sort of thing. But you know, most people have more than one injury when you, when you come off a bike. Um, you're almost certainly, looking at that, going to do your lower limb, and a large percentage of people also do their upper limb. And you know, I was absolutely no exception um, to that rule in that I had both upper and lower limb injuries. Um, so in terms of if you're going to crash, ways to murder a motorcycle, um, first thing, you can hit something. Um, that's, you know, that takes two. It takes two to tango, so you can hit a car. Um, if you remember from my other presentation, there was that fellow that came off at the, the other bend. I showed you the, the video clip of that. Um, and so he actually came around the corner, hesitated, and hit the W rail um, in front of him. Uh, you can hit a rock wall, a tree, and then 
um, anything that's coming the other way. And yes. Sorry, with the pattern, do we? Yeah. Do you need right leg, left arm? Right? Yeah. Is that unusual? Um, I don't think so. And I think potentially for me, uh, you know, if you think about if I'm sitting on my bike, I'd say the car hit my leg. Um, the handlebars being turned back the other way is what broke my wrist, and then the whole lot falling over and the fuel tank um, landing on my arm is probably what broke my arm. Um, I don't know for sure because I don't actually know quite what happened, but it's all, it's all speculation, but it's equally believable. Um, so the other kind of uh, crashes that you can have which require only one effort, one your own, um, is that you can low side and hit something, or you can high side. Um, and so this is where terminology starts to become a little bit, uh, bit interesting. So a low side essentially results from traction, lo losing traction on the front wheel while you're lent over. Um, and there's a few reasons why, why that can happen. You can be leaning just simply too much. Uh, you can be going too fast and as a result you sort of exceed the amount of traction that you've got. Uh, you can be braking and turning at the, fr at the same time. So, uh, a motorcycle, you cannot apply the front brake whilst you're lent over because it takes too much, too much traction. So you've got to actually stand the bike up, brake, and then lean again. Uh, or if you're really, you know, being a hero down at Brooklyn on a, on a Sunday, you can scrape the hard parts of the bike on the road. And what that does is effectively just lever the tyre um, off the road. Uh, so what actually happens is you fall uh, about 50 centimetres and um, then, if you're lucky, you slide along a bit. Um, and this happens all the time in, in MotoGP and they get up and they walk away from it. Um, and the reason they get up and they walk away from it is because they don't hit anything. These tracks are massive, they've got very soft gravel areas, they've got like runoff and, and that sort of stuff. They're designed for people to do this. Um, on the public roads that doesn't often happen. Uh, you know, you only have to slide a few metres before you're going to hit something. Even that little white thing that's got the reflector on it is a serious obstacle if you hit it at speed. Um, to show you actually, this is what it looks like. So this is an American video um, and YouTube's full of videos of people riding motorcycles badly. Um, so this guy is what we call a squid, uh, which stands for stupidly quick, underdressed, imminently dead. Um, and you can tell that he's a squid because he's riding a jigsaw, he's got a helmet mohawk and he's not really wearing any particular protective gear. Um, and if you have a look at what's about to happen to him, you'll see that all of a sudden he's going along and then the front wheel lets go and he goes for a slide. And he actually stops before he hits the dirt embankment there, so that's, that's good for him. Um, what that means uh, is that you're, you're going to get abrasions, but you're also, if you hit something, it's the same as a fall from height. So if you're going along and you hit a brick wall, it's the same as hitting that brick wall as if you'd just fallen that far. Um, so be aware that eff effectively, if you know that someone has come in, they've hit something on during their low side crash, then they, you should treat them as though they've had a fall from height. Okay? Um, abrasions result from two things. There's uh, direct forces, you know, the road is like a, a cheese grater, um, and you also get significant thermal energy um, as a result of that. And so they can essentially be the same as a full thickness burn, and uh, many sort of uh, trauma services do manage them essentially the same way. Um, so of concern, there are two things. If you slide along and you hit something feet first, there's nothing to rule out the fact that you haven't hit your head or your base of spine or base of skull, sorry, uh, or anything in the interim. So if you've got a rider who's in front of you and he's got, you know, pretty badly smashed up feet from where he's gone feet first into a wall, uh, but he's strangely unconscious, you really need to think about has he done something to his, to his head, particularly his, his base of skull. And the other thing is that if you roll and you then tumble over each other, you can get significant torsion um, applied to your neck uh, as a result of that. So the other kind of crash is a high side, and this is significantly less fun. Um, basically, it results from a loss of traction on the rear wheel. And uh, what happens is that so you're going around, you're lent over, the rear wheel loses traction and it drifts wide as a result, of just purely from force. At some point, it will regain traction, and when that happens, it's jerked back in, and so the whole motorcycle gets this really powerful yawing motion and it throws you off over the handlebars, and that's why it's called, uh, called a high side. And of course, I've got a video of it. Um, I feel quite sorry for this guy because I know just what's about to happen to him. Um, so if you look at this very carefully, you'll see he's coming along and then all of a sudden the rear wheel goes wide about there and then it gets thrown in and he goes over the top, okay? That's a high side crash. Um, as you can see, his bike's not finished with him yet and it chases him up the road for a bit as well. Uh, and these guys at speed can get 
significantly airborne. Um, and so this guy's fallen a long way. In addition to the fact that he's come off at speed, he's fallen. And that's the main point to remember with a, with a high side injury. Um, you can get quite significantly unusual attitudes um, in, in these sorts of crashes. And they tend to catch you by surprise because they usually happen at full speed. Um, you know, when you're coming out of, accelerating out of a bend or, or, or that sort of thing, it's pretty, pretty, pretty quick. Um, so the main thing with, with a high side crash uh, is to think of the head and the C-spine because they have had a fall from height. And it's really, you know, it's, a lot of this is sort of more relevant to the, maybe the ambulance and the emergency department, but we are occasionally involved with this, so it's useful just to know what the, that rider has actually been through. Um, obviously, primary prevention is, um, is probably the most important thing, and so this is really about protective gear. Um, protective gear is, is unusual uh, in that it's fundamentally designed not to come off. Um, so if you're going to take someone's jacket or their leather pants or, or that sort of thing off them, you really need to have a plan um, because it's designed to resist pretty much everything that you can throw at it. Um, if you're going to cut someone's leather off them, the seams are usually the weakest point. Um, a lot of the premium quality gear has you know, multiple seams and, and that sort of stuff, but the seam is still the weakest point. Um, Leather is usually about 1.3 to 1.4 millimetres thick, uh, unless it's kangaroo leather, in which case it's a little bit thinner. Um, the other thing about protective gear is that you can use it um, after the crash. And so if you're wearing tight leather and you know, have really bad lower limb fractures, that's going to act as a, essentially like a mast suit, which I know is a bit controversial, um, but under some circumstances it might actually help. Uh, and it can be used to you know, pick the rider up and keep the bits together for the police, the ambulance, or the coroner. Um, so, uh, military anti-shock trousers. So, sort of like a pneumatic lower, lower suit that was put on and blown up to sort of push blood centrally. Yeah. Um, so, it's a bit it's controversial in, in civilian use. Um, so, protective gear, you know, it's not very overly cool, but it does actually work. And, uh, you know, I crashed at a combined speed of somewhere between 80 and 120 k's an hour. Uh, and I was wearing essentially what I wore to work today. Um, so a hel helmet, obviously. Um, Kevlar denim, so these are lined with Kevlar um, for abrasion resistance. Um, leather jacket with body armour. And then boots, gloves, my hearing protection, all of it. And the only soft tissue injuries that I got in my accident was a laceration this big on my left leg and this big on my, on my right leg. Uh, and it really does actually um, help. I'm not kidding in that saying it's not going to protect you from blunt impact force. You know, if you crash it at 100 k's an hour, you, no amount of protective gear is going to stop you from breaking your leg. But what it does mean is that I didn't get uh, abrasions, I didn't get burnt, I didn't get infected metalware, I didn't need skin grafts or, you know, develop contractures down the track. So it does actually have its, its purpose in reducing um, morbidity with, with accidents. Uh, and there is actually some evidence that it works. Um, so this is a study done by the George Institute in, uh, I think, when did I say, 2011. Um, and what they basically looked at was, or the primary outcome here was admission to hospital following a, following a motorcycle crash. Um, and it was, you know, there was a, a significant relative risk reduction if you were wearing a jacket, pants and gloves. One of the things that they did find out um, is that a lot of the gear they ended up considering not fit for purpose. And by that, they meant uh, if, they, if it had abraded all the way through to the point where the rider would have been exposed, that they considered that it would not have been fit for purpose. That's a significant percentage of gear that's sort of sold in, in motorcycle stores. So it's worth investing the money and making sure that you've got the really decent gear because it's, it, does, it does work. There's a couple of problems with this. Um, this particular study, they excluded um, people with head injuries and spine injuries. So I had a head injury because uh, I had a concussion, so I would have been excluded um, from, from this study. And um, only 16.5% of the crashes in this study occurred at speeds greater than um, 60 kilometres an hour. So again, it's not overly relevant to high speed trauma. Um, Protective gear has a few particular features about it that I just wanted to take you through because they're relevant to anaesthetists. The first is a speed hump. Uh, and basically what that is is it's a foam block that's inserted in the back of a, a, um, a jacket that so goes here. Uh, and it's purely aerodynamic in nature. It does absolutely nothing for spine protection. It's not a spine protector. Spine protectors are usually clipped inside your jacket and they sit much closer on your skin down here like that. Um, 
So it's purely aerodynamic to reduce the wind going over your helmet. Um, and I can tell you that at you know, 200 kilometers per hour, your helmet does start doing this because of the, the wind pressure. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, but uh, that's Guy Martin, again, at the Isle of Man TT. Um, what it does do is it does completely wreck the normal alignment of your spine when, it play, when you're placed supine. So you cannot uh, conventionally intubate someone while they've got a speed hump in situ. Uh, and the, I mean, you might be able to with a video scope or, or something like that, but if someone comes in and they're in a, you know, the, the bay and they're still in their jacket and there's a speed hump there, you're really making yourself uh, quite difficult, making them quite difficult to intubate. Um, so the easiest way to do that is basically you just log roll them to the side, you get a scalpel, you cut along the seam and take it out. Okay, so you just cut along there and it just slides out as a foam block. And then you turn it around and use it as a nice little pillow. Um, motorcycle boots, again, they're fundamentally designed not to come off. Um, if that boot has come off during the crash, it does mean that at some point in the events of that crash, that foot has been made to point backwards. Um, and that has happened, that happens very quickly. So if you put your foot down at, at 150 k's an hour, within probably half a second, your foot is going to be facing the other way. Um, what that does mean then is that you've got extreme rotational force that's been applied pretty much to the entire limb all the way up to the pelvis. And so you really need to have a very low suspicion for uh, uh, lower limb injuries and up to the pelvis. Um, so helmets. Um, Helmets, they're an expensive single-use uh, item, and really for um, anything greater than one metre, if you drop a helmet greater than one metre, you could potentially have um, affected its crash safety. Uh, and that's why I keep mine, uh, I know where it is at all times, and I don't leave it lying around on the lockers at work or, or that sort of thing, because I'm terrified that someone will drop it or knock it off and just put it back, not realising that I then actually don't have a helmet that's going to work. Um, it's important to note that even in a really juicy high side, um, your helmet may look relatively undamaged but be completely structurally destroyed um, inside. So um, just be aware of that, that yes, the helmet might look great, but the rider could still have had quite significant force transmitted to his head. Um, a couple of other things. Some of the newer helmets have emergency release pads. So if you look at the base of the helmet, where uh, around here, and you'll see there's two little red strips, you just pull it. Um, all that does is take the cheek pads out of the helmet and then you can then slide the helmet off. So it makes the removal much, uh, much easier. And occasionally you'll find some have a QR code on them somewhere stuck on them that you can actually scan and will get, give you information about uh, potentially that rider or, or the helmet or how to remove it. Um, so it's just sort of two little sides. The other thing you can do, uh, if you can't take the helmet off, is that you can actually destabilise it. Um, the incidence of failure to remove a helmet is about 1 in 2,000. Uh, and this is really just a plan B to access the airway. Uh, so all you do is you basically saw through the front of it. Um, so you get a, a wire saw or a jiggly saw that used to be used for cutting legs off, uh, and you just poke it down through and saw the front, the chin bar, off the helmet, which will give you access to the airway. Um, the other thing you can do is push a endotracheal tube down through there first if you're worried about cutting the patient as well. So you just push a tube through, drop the saw through the tube and saw it out. Um, Emergency ID um, is also quite useful. So um, when I had my accident, it took about eight hours for my parents to find out that I had been in an accident. And I think that's because I was being uncooperative in the emergency department and refused to unlock my phone. <laughs> um, but uh, I actually put all of the emergency information, um, all of that actually in my phone. Um, and nobody knew how to access it. So on an iPhone, if, if the person has set it, if you just turn it on and look at the lock screen, slide it to unlock, and then you'll see down the bottom there's the emergency button. Touch it, touch emergency, and then you'll see if it's set, um, there's a button called medical ID, and that will um, display that medical ID. And if you've got an iPhone, you set all that via the health app um, on the newer versions of iOS. I don't know quite how to do it for Android, because I don't think the, um, the device does it by default, but I think you can get add-ons for it. Um, or if you're like me now, um, you actually just carry uh, some ID on you. And so I wear this when I'm now out of town. Um, so if I'm going anywhere where I'm not going to end up in a Hunter New England hospital, um, then I wear this on my wrist. It's just a little, little bracelet. Um, if you've read The House of God, you'll know there's no human being whose medical information doesn't fit on a 3x5 index card. That's a hell of a lot smaller. Um, and it's probably um, the only one going around with a Cormac Lehane classification on it, which I think if I turned up in your anaesthetic bay, you would probably, you would probably actually want to know. Um, so 
Um, look, this this sort of stuff is is you know it's an incredibly fun thing to do, and um, I can you know I turned 30 last year before I had this accident, and uh, although the saying goes that life begins at 50, um, you can take it on good authority. It doesn't begin or begin to get properly interesting until you get to 150. Um, I've met uh, a hell of a lot of people uh, doing this. I've drunk in some truly terrible coffee. I've eaten quite a few pies and supported hopefully a few worthy causes. Um, it's quite incredible, you know, when you, you sort of meet these just people who've got this common interest of just getting out and feeling the wind on your back or, or something on a Sunday morning after a crap week at work. Um, and it's very much, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of my therapy. Uh, and I think there's probably a, a, a reason why you don't see too many of these things parked out the front of the psychiatrist. But I have had reason to park mine out the front of the physiotherapist. Uh, and I'm acutely aware that grey-haired riders uh, don't get that way entirely based on accident. Um, based on luck, sorry. Um, so equally, you know, the, the last sort of year of, of my life has really made me reflect quite a lot about uh, why it is that we, you know, do the things that we do and why we as, as, as doctors and the medical profession more generally look after people who need our care the most. Uh, you know, people do all sorts of stupid things and that includes riding, you know, motorcycles ridiculously fast at speeds the human body was never designed to travel. Um, and I think it's important that people actually get that chance. Uh, and to me, it's really focused my own ideas about clinical practice, that it's, to me, it's very rewarding to actually give someone the chance to have a chance to live. And that's my story. Any questions? <laughs>